So when it comes to cancer, again, going back to what we know so far, the fact that they have these increased insulin receptors on the cell surface, they're looking for glucose. How big of a piece is obesity in and of itself contributing to cancer? Or is it more just the underlying association to insulin and glucose? Obesity is kind of what got me interested in this whole piece to begin with, because I was dealing mostly with women's cancers like breast cancer and endometrial cancer, which are very highly associated with obesity. So my whole practice originally was, can I get patients to lose weight and trying to employ some form of low carbohydrate diets to do that? And it wasn't until I kind of finally put two and two together and, okay, well, why do skinny people have cancer? Is it really about obesity? And then when you actually look, there's data that says even if you're obese or your normal weight, it really comes down to insulin. It's not about the obesity. It, I usually say if you are carrying extra weight, I know that insulin is too high in you at times. It may not be too high. If I did a fasting insulin, it might still look. So after fasting overnight and getting a morning insulin, it might actually look okay. But if you're carrying extra weight, it means that insulin is being active during the day because insulin is what is creating that fat storage. And um, so I do think that there's a little bit of a nuance, right? So let, I'm going to go back to ancestral bears, you know, that bears going into hibernation, they eat a bunch of honey and berries and fruit, fructose to create insulin resistance so that they become obese so that they can go and they can hibernate. And then they can burn that fat and then they come out and they're back to their thin uh, and, and now food is plentiful. So they don't need to eat the honey and berries. So, so there is, it can go both ways. We can eat in such a way that we create insulin resistance and then we create obesity. But there's also kind of the flip side in that maybe we're not insulin resistant per se, but we are getting, we're over consuming. Um, we talk about calories in, calories out, and it's not so much that as that our fake food environment, it, it, there's very little protein and healthy fats, and we tend to overeat. We don't, we don't, we have broken insulin signaling. We have broken satiety hormones, um, and we tend to overeat. We stuff our fat cells with fat, but, and then our cells become resistant to that signal. And now we start to get higher and higher levels, even at fasting. It has to stay up all the time to kind of keep things in. But interestingly, there was a study observational that came out a few years back showing that, oh, well, why is obesity seem to be protective in the younger breast cancer population or younger woman population? They had less breast cancer, but obesity when you're older postmenopausal seem to have much higher risks of breast cancer. And if we think about it from a storage perspective, so maybe we're having ups and downs in insulin, but our fat cells are still taking up fat pretty easily. So we don't need excessively high insulin levels. We're just glucose comes in, insulin is released, glucose and fatty acids are put away, our cells are still receptive, so then insulin drops back down. So it's only going up kind of after we eat and it's coming back down. But as we do that over and over and over and over, so decades of that, well, now our cells are like, there's no more room at the end. You know, you need more insulin to push and push and push that in. It doesn't happen. So at, as we age, we become more insulin resistant. So it seemed to go along with that insulin resistance piece where we started to have elevated insulin. But again, the researchers didn't understand that metabolic feature. So they just said, oh, and I was with a group of, you know, breast cancer physicians saying, I don't know what this means. Fat's okay. It's good for you when you're young. It's bad for you when you're bad being obese. And it's like, well, no, that's not, it, it means we're on the wrong path already. But we tend to get more insulin resistant as we age. And sadly, in our today's population, everything seems to be starting earlier and earlier. So what used to be a postmenopausal disease is now 
a midlife disease, even an early life disease. All right. So to try and highlight the essence of what you just got into there, if we are obese, there is an insulin problem and we need to address that. But if we're not, we could still have an insulin problem and insulin resistance building up in the background over years. So insulin is the driver we want to be looking at when it comes to cancer. You touched on the nuances of testing for insulin. It sounds like even a fasting insulin test can be give us a false reading depending on where the person is along their journey. So what I'm getting at here, given ins- it all comes down to insulin, and we really, as an individual, whether we're obese or not, we want to be aware of that level and what's happening in the body. What's the best way to test to get our baseline? So I always still recommend getting a you know, overnight fast set of blood work on a routine basis. And if you're otherwise healthy, you might only do that once a year. Others might need to do it more um, routinely. Um, But I will look at not only insulin and glucose, but also the interaction between the two. So there are some calculations that we can look at. I will also look at fasting triglyceride levels. So triglycerides are the fat that's in our bloodstream. So we have, again, two fuels, glucose and triglycerides are fat. And if both of them are elevated, there's a big problem. If one of them are elevated, there's still a problem. But again, it's the balance between the two. Um, And I will also look at triglyceride HDL ratio. So HDL, one of the cholesterol markers, but triglyceride divided by HDL is another way that we can look at insulin resistance. So I try to look at all three and in everybody. And those three can give us some guidance if any one of them are abnormal, again, in my range, not in a conventional range, um, then we know that there's some degree of insulin resistance. If all of them are normal, but I have signs in a patient, maybe they have um, a lot of uh, in between meal, uh, hunger, anxiety, dep- you know, like they have a lot of the, the uh, symptoms, the hangry symptoms that people will often comment about. But if they can't easily skip a meal, um, m- many people don't want to skip a meal, but if they had to, they could and they would still be functioning fine. Um, but if somebody is walking around going, I need food right now because I, I think I might die, you know, that is a sign of significant insulin resistance, actually. It's insulin is still on and pushing that glucose down. So I do have some people, typically in my younger population, that still have fasting numbers that look okay. But when you really question them about how do they feel, what about brain fog, fatigue, you know, um, all of these other symptoms, then you can, you, you think that there's probably something hiding in between those, the fasting numbers. Um, and there are ways to check. We can always put a continuous glucose meter on somebody. Um, we could do a postprandial insulin. Um, I tend not to do those because it's a little hard to time in a lab properly, but there are there are some ways to know. The other way to do it is, hey, change your diet, see how you feel. Because guess what? All those things tend to go away once we stabilize somebody's blood sugar. I could see how somebody could make the argument that if they have the genetics that when they're consuming too many carbohydrates and they're putting on weight, that could actually be a good thing because they have an outward appearance change that's going to trigger that something's awry versus the person that genetically can build up insulin in the background and continue to produce more and more, have insulin resistance, and then end up potentially, you know, getting something like cancer or another chronic disease, and then finding out they have a problem that way. It is a tough one. I think that our vanity, you know, is is something good. I think that when we put on excess weight, I think most of us are like, oh, I wish I could take off that 10 pounds, that 20 pounds, that 100 pounds, whatever it is. And so, I love it when people come to a ketogenic diet for weight loss because it is a powerful motivator, but you're absolutely correct. How many skinny people 
are out there that say, I can eat anything, it doesn't matter. And they do eat anything because they think it doesn't matter. And I am constantly trying to remind people it is not about weight, it's about health. It's about what are your cells doing. So even if you're thin, most thin people will still have some complaints, joint aches or brain fog or something else that gives you the clue that they still have some issues going on with their metabolism. But let's say they feel great, they think they look great, they're exercising great, they think they're eating the best diet. There are ways to look. And and certainly we um, can do my lab testing. There's more advanced testing where you can do DEXA scans and actually look at visceral fat because sometimes they don't have a protuberant belly. Uh, You know, they don't have a beer belly. Um, but they do have significant visceral fat in their belly. And that's a sign that we have insulin resistance problem. I always say getting a blood test is cheaper, faster, and and only if it doesn't give us the answers we need, then, you know, do we need to go to a more advanced test? So if somebody were to come to see you, whether they have a belly or not, you do the testing, you find out their insulin is running too high, and they adopt a ketogenic diet, how long does it take for the insulin to start correcting itself? It varies, and it also varies on how a patient structures their diet. So even though I give them instructions, not always are they followed 100%, right? Um, you know, it's a, some, for some people, it's extremely new and overwhelming, and they're making small changes, and we just keep kind of refining, refining, refining. But I have seen uh, fasting insulin drop very quickly. I think that if you have not been insulin resistant for your entire life, then it comes down quicker. So I feel like sometimes younger folks or, or folks that just started noticing some of these things, I, I tend to have a much quicker reversal. Whereas um, people who have been, you know, maybe morbidly obese for decades and their insulin is quite high, you know, 10 times, not quite maybe 10, but at least five to 10 times higher than I want to see it. Sometimes that's a much slower process. Um, and sometimes we have to look a little bit further than just food. We've talked about, uh, you know, it's not just food, but maybe it's environmental toxins that are estrogen mimickers that are driving insulin uh, elevations. Maybe it's um, sedentary behavior. We know that exercise and various forms of exercise can help with that. So when I see a patient, even though my main focus is working on their diet, it is still trying to optimize their other pieces. How do we optimize sleep if that's an issue? How do we look for toxins in their environment if they've never even thought about it before? Um, how do we uh, add in exercise? you know, going from someone who only walks to can we do something more than walking um, on occasion. I'm glad you brought up these other aspects. And throughout our conversation, I want to dive more into some of them. But coming back to the diet piece, so insulin resistance, it sounds like it's generally correctable. But you gave the example there of a patient that's been obese for a long time. Say you see, well, basically what I'm getting at here is do you see people that have been overweight for a long period of time, producing too much insulin, blood sugar, you know, running awry, where their pancreas is so beat up from that and doing that for so many years that they can't crack the insulin or is there hope for, have you seen no, that with the patient? Hope. Okay. There's hope. I think uh, it's important we get into the whole piece because somebody might be tuning into this and they're 70 years old and they feel like I've been overweight for since I can remember and I know that my insulin's been all over the place and my blood glucose. And I want to give them hope as well that they can still make these changes and correct the underlying challenge. Absolutely. I, I see that even most most people coming to me have never had an insulin checked. So they know that their sugars are high. They know their hemoglobin A1C, which is a quote unquote three month average of glucose might be high. They So they know they have either prediabetes or diabetes they may tell me, I've tried every diet in the book, nothing works, right? So now we have to say, okay, let's look under the hood. Because I think sometimes when they see these numbers and the, and I say, 
This is why you can't lose weight. You have a fasting insulin of 20. Like you are on high storage mode. So we need to get that down. You know, down, I like to see it less than four. Um, so how do we move that in the right um, direction? So first is let's create a ketogenic diet right for you. And many, many times patients will just go on low carb diets, which are also low fat. And then they may never break into that fat burning. So I have seen patients that until I got them eating high fat, they would not lose weight. As soon as we got them eating high fat, they started losing weight. I have seen patients who constantly calorie restrict, but so they're eating 800, 1200 calories a day. And if you're eating that little, your body thinks, you know, that hibernation is coming, that, by, that a famine is coming and that your body naturally will try to hold on to that weight because it doesn't think more food is coming. So we really have to play into getting our body being happy, healthy, and feel like there's no care in the world, that everything is going to be hunky-dory tomorrow because it's remaining in that fight or flight mode that really can hinder results. So there are some folks that I struggle getting their insulin down, even though I've had some lose weight, their weight is going down. They feel great and their insulin's still high even. So there's, there's all kinds, all kinds of folks out there. Um, and what we have found with some is that by putting a continuous glucose meter on them, um, we start to get some more information. And some people I feel like are pushing the intermittent fasting thing a little too much. And it's actually creating more stress to the system and that when they actually eat scheduled meals, they do better. Or maybe when they remove dairy, dairy can be inflammatory in some people. So again, it's really trying to work with that individual. Um, but I always say it's never too late to start. I even have a 90 year old that I'm working with that has had wonderful results in her cancer um, uh, results uh, without actually getting to conventional therapies because she was on hospice or I shouldn't say that she was encouraged to go on to hospice. And she said, no, and I don't want your chemotherapy. And I'm just, you know, and she had a bad ovarian cancer and was swelling because of ascites in her belly and her tumor markers were going up. And we just tried to end her cachexia. So she was wasting. Her muscles were very, we could see it in her protein markers, but we got her on a good ketogenic diet, encouraged her to eat every two hours, actually. And all of a sudden, her protein markers are looking better. Her fluid is less. She's getting less draining. She's out in her garden working. And her her tumor marker dropped about 50% just by changing what she was eating. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. This is your body saying, hey, I finally had to throw down this really big, scary word at you so that you would stop and listen, so that you would stop and look. And so now let's just work to see what is...